Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. You are here with us today at the Awkward Innovate webinar, Digital Health, What Will Stay and What Will Get Left Behind? My name is Alon Reutman. I'm a business development analyst here at our crowd, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We're very, very happy to have you here with us. So basically the questions in the title of this webinar, what will stay and what will get left behind, are questions we asked our portfolio companies that are presenting here today. Because we're seeing this amazing acceleration of digital health throughout the pandemic. And I think this is one of the most interesting questions that is now being asked. So luckily enough, you were smart enough to register and to hear from some of the brightest minds in, the, in this field. We have great content for you today, and we, we are really happy to have you with us. So just a bit about our plan for today, what, who will be speaking and about what. We're gonna start with a quick overview of our crowd by Lali David, head of business development here at, here at our crowd. And we're gonna continue with Dan Fischer who will speak about innovation at times of crisis in general. And then we will continue with an overview about the acceleration I just spoke about in digital health by Yossi Bagon, and then followed by presentation by our, by our portfolio companies, Titocare, Cytoreason, and Medisafe. It's going to be great. I would like to invite Lali David, Head of Business Development here at Arpad. Hi, everyone. Uh, good being here. So we're going to go um, over this quickly. Um, so a few words about our crowd. So our crowd, uh, as probably most of you know, is the most active investor in Israel. Uh, our crowd is, uh, is a unique uh, hybrid of a venture capital with a crowdfunding platform. And the way it works is that we choose deals that we want to invest in and we invite the crowd to join us. The crowd is a diverse crowd. The crowd includes uh, accredited investors, family offices, institutional investors, corporate VCs, uh, investment arms. Uh, all of them can join us in deals that we decide to invest in. And again, we put 5% uh, uh, of our own fund in every deal that we decide to invest in. So we look at about 200 companies, we deep dive, negotiate the term sheet and, and go through the uh, investment process. So far, we actually have close to $1.5 billion committed. Uh, we, invested that we invested directly in 220 uh, deals. We have 22 different funds um, and more. This is a snapshot of our portfolio. This uh, is updated uh, continuously. We, invite, we invest in uh, different sectors, different stages, and different geographies. 75, 70, 75% of our investments are in Israel. Um, and we have a very good, uh, very extremely well uh, portfolio in, uh, in healthcare and digital health. These are different funds that we either created uh, or uh, co-invested, joined as LPs in existing funds. Uh, Cure, which uh, we're gonna hear from uh, next, uh, is our digital health fund. We also have funds where we simply took an LP position and enabled our investors to join as investors in those funds. Funds like sector-specific funds like Maniv, uh, USVP in the Silicon Valley, uh, OFEC here in Israel, F2 in Israel, uh, and others. So the funds are either sector specific or geography specific. Um, we also have a, a, an incubator practice that we are extremely proud of. Uh, we have four licenses from the government of Israel for what we call here Hamamat Madan. So four uh, incubators that are either geographic or thematic or both. Um, the, the, mo the, more, the most established one is in Jerusalem in its third year, uh, Lab 02. Uh, in deep tech, we have uh, our incubator in Be'er Sheva in uh, cybersecurity and digital health. We have food tech incubator in the north, uh, and we have cannabis focused incubator also in the south, and we have a new incubator in New Zealand. Again, the four Israeli startups are all backed by the Ministry of Innovation. Um, we co-invest alongside leading VCs, uh, leading angel investors, and we have different ways of collaborating or co-investing with uh, leading multinational companies. And I'm sure many of you here in the crowd are executives in, in different multinational companies, and we're welcome to have a, a conversation with you about different ways that we collaborate. Uh, we have a unique way of collaborating with distribution partners with different uh, globally leading banks, uh, UB in Singapore, um, NAB in, uh, in Australia and Reliance uh, Capital in India. And the most recent one is uh, Stiefel in the US. Stiefel, sorry, okay. Stiefel is, uh, is our recent distribution partners in the US and we extremely value uh, the relationship uh, we established recently with, uh, with Stiefel. We uh, have 
so many different ways of collaborating, collaborating with, uh, with multinational companies that we have created our crowd innovate which is uh, basically the program under which we find those different uh, ways and these are some of the enterprises that are our partners in uh, our crowd innovate who basically understand where the enterprise is in terms of the innovation journey uh, and we identify the right um, service blocks for that specific uh, multinational company, whether it's knowledge, engagement, or community. And this is all led by uh, Dan Fischel, who's going to speak with you next about different uh, lessons learned and best practices in terms of uh, rethinking corporate innovation uh, these days. Dan, to you. Thank you, Lali. And I want to start with a question. Are you in good company? Or better, or do you work for a good company? And what is a good company anyway in, in the new normal? And don't get me wrong, I mean, this is the new normal. We are already in it. This is how our life is going to look in the foreseeable future. So what is a good company in the new normal? So our answer is that a good company in the new normal is not necessarily the one that strives very hard to keep as much cash in the bank account as possible preparing for the rainy days ahead. It is a company that strives very, very hard to adapt to the stormy days ahead. And I'm talking about hard data. Uh, McKinsey, the smart guys, they found out that uh, history shows that corporations that invest in innovation during a crisis, and this is like the 2008 crisis, they outperform their peers during the, the recovery by up to 30%, up to 30% if you invest in innovation right now. But ironically, McKinsey, the same smart guys, they also claim that at the moment, the commitment to innovation is decreasing. Corporations are prioritizing their core business. They're prioritizing the cash in the bank over innovation activities. And this is very alarming. This is alarming because even before COVID, the lifespan of S&P 500 companies has been decreasing exponentially from 60 years to less than 20 today to just about 12 in a few years from now. Now, why this is happening? The main reason is technology disruption. Now, tech disruption, I don't have to tell you, it's nothing new. It's been with us since the Industrial Revolution. I mean, the cars, they uh, disrupted the horse. Uh, what's new? is the pace in which tech disruption is happening right now. And that is because tech adoption is up the roof. Tech adoption's never been faster. If you look at this chart, it took Americans about 50 years to adopt electricity in their homes. It took them less than 10 to adopt the smartphone. Now, all of this is before COVID. What's happening now is tech adoption at a rate never seen before in human history. And there's many indicators. If it's Amazon that's hiring 100,000 employees to meet demand, or Ocado, the largest online supermarket in the UK that introduced until very recently virtual queues. You had to wait two hours before you would allow into the website to do your grocery shopping. Now, you may claim that for every company that's been doing extremely well during the crisis, there are many others who don't, like Airbnb or, or Booking.com or, or Uber, and, and you're right. But something very dramatic has changed. First, the tech adoption for the first time is reaching new demographics like the elderly. Never happened before. And the second one is that it's changing consumer behaviors. It's changing human behaviors like never before. In the UK, for the first time in 700 years, MPs are allowed to vote online. In uh, New York, for the first time, you can get married online in Israel. You can find a complaint with the police online. We're all working from home. And you know what? It's working quite well. Actually, most surveys, most polls say that we are actually more productive working from home to the extent that the Morgan Stanley CEO says we don't need as much real estate. And the, uh, you know, the Barclays CEO says pretty much the same. You know, the office of the future is going to be radically different than the office we had in 2019. And we didn't even discuss, and we will discuss today, telemedicine that's used is, is up the roof. And, and, and most Americans, you know, either they're saying that they're either willing to try or already tried it. And those who tried it, 97% of them, 97% say they're gonna schedule another appointment 
And of course, everyone's talking about online grocery shopping. Ladies and gents, it's more than tripled. It's more than tripled in March compared to August with 40% elderly senior citizens buying for the first time. To the extent that the Microsoft CEO puts it in words, say we've seen two years of digital transformation just happening in two months. And do you think it's going back? It's not going back. History shows us the tech adoption does not reverse. Not a single time in human history we've seen this happening, that the technology is being adopted and then abandoned. And if we had to put it qualitatively on this, on this chart, it would be a straight line up, the digitization of everything that is not digital. So that's about tech adoption. Now let's talk about automation. And by automation, I mean the process by which humans are replaced by machines. We tend to think about it as a linear process. Every year, there's more humans that are replaced by more, more machines, and it is wrong. It is wrong. It does not happen in a linear way. It happens in peaks, in bursts, and these are centered around economic crisis. It happens because the relative cost of labor goes up when company revenues go down, so corporations simply lay off employees. And we've seen it happening in 2008, in 2000, and in 1991, spikes of automation. Now, what type of jobs are being lost? And that's very important to understand. It's all low income, or the vast majority is low income jobs that people that perform routine jobs that can be easily automated. And all these people that have been laid off in the past, but also right now, are being or will be replaced by a mix of technology and highly skilled workers. And you can see that after the 2008 recession, there's been a spike in the requirement for employees that are better educated with better skills and more importantly, better computer skills. But there's one thing that is radically different in this recession compared to all, all three previous ones. And that is not just the number of, of people who lost their jobs that is more than double the one of 2008. So it's not about jobs lost, it's about the technology that we have right now. And that technology that we have right now, for the first time in history, can replace humans, not just in manual labor, but also in cognitive skills. AI, machine learning, deep learning. These technologies will shape corporations in years to come. Their impact on our economy and our society is gonna be dramatic. So, we're going to touch all these subjects in our next webinar, which is on July 23rd, Rethinking Corporate Innovation. We're going to discuss about the points of tech adoption and automation, but we're also going to discuss how your sector is being affected. Are you going to go through an acceleration of existing technologies, or do you need to undergo a transformation into new technologies? We're going to talk about who are the real competitors in the new normal, and I'm going to give you a spoiler. They are called startups. And we're going to talk about what should corporations do at times of uncertainty. And I'm going to give you a spoiler. They should invest or partner with startups because the only vaccine to COVID is technology. And we're going to explain why. So once again, July 23rd at 7 p.m. Israel, Rethinking Corporate Innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. That's, some, that's definitely something to look forward to. And after that, we understood the case for innovation in times of crisis. Let's take a deep dive into what's happening in the digital health sector, because you know this is the reason we came here today. And we are very, very fortunate to have with us today Yossi Bagon. Yossi is a man Dr. Yossi Bagon is a managing managing partner at Cure, our project digital health fund. It is actually the first fund in Israel to be exclusively focused on digital health. Prior to Cure, Yossi founded. Uh, Klalit, Israel's largest healthcare organization, uh, digital division. So we, I think there's no one better than Yossi to give us this overview of what's happening in the digital health sector during this outbreak. So Yossi, please. Thank you, Alon. Uh, can I have a survey that of people uh, voting whether I look like my picture, younger or older? So we'll do it later on. In the next... Uh, in the next uh, five minutes, I will give a quick review on what's ha what happened to digital health during the last three, four months, uh, what we call healthcare inflection point, because what we are witnessing that is happening today in digital health 
in a normal world would have taken years. In our world, things take weeks to months. And the slides uh, would speak for them for themselves. So this is a slide presenting uh, the last uh, uh, few years with regards to digital health investments year over year. And you can see while there is a consistent growth over uh, uh, the years, what is happening in 2020 way exceeds what happened before. And this is of special interest because one would have expected that in these kind of times, people will save uh, money for rainy days, but in the digital health space, we see that actually the complete opposite is happening. And this will also be evident in the next few slides. In 2020, in this first half of 2020, more than $5 billion were invested in digital health solutions. This is also evident with regards to the market maturity. If you will really look what is the deal size trends over years, you can see how this out per deal, the amounts invested are growing in the first half of 2020. An average deal uh, was a bit above $25 million which takes us also, excuse me, which takes us also for which are the areas, and uh, this was mentioned before, but here are the numbers, which are the areas that health investors expect growth uh, to be most prominent in the next few years. As you can imagine, the most prominent uh, sectors are the ones that enable uh, medicine to be provided and delivered uh, via remote channels. And we will hear later on from Eyal, from Taito, how they took this uh, telemedicine trend and, and turned it into something that uh, no other company uh, delivers today. And this is also the same expectations are also well reflected in this investment picture where you see where investors put their money and it's actually a mirror to the expectation slide I showed before. This is the, the maturity of the field and the overall trend of digital health becoming mainstream and fast is also well represented in the big deals amounts. And you can see here uh, the number of companies that raised above $100 million. And this list is growing on a month to month basis. And similarly, the companies that exceed a billion dollar worth uh, is also you can see here, what you see here is how, what is the frequency of companies growing beyond unicorns. And while it was scarce at the early years, you can see how it becomes a more and more crowded along the last two years. Worth also mentioning is what is in parallel happening in the regulation and reimbursement trends. So both the FDA uh, has uh, eased uh, its uh, regulation to enable uh, remote patient monitoring to support COVID-19. And once you are more flexible, it can stop only in COVID-19 related initiatives. And likewise, reimbursement models are also uh, flourishing and accelerated significantly during the last uh, three months. And as stated here, once things that 
are out there and are already working at the, uh, for tens of millions of patients in the US, you can't just put it back into the box. As a numeric example, and this is something that started in 2019, but today is becoming more and more evident, uh, using remote patient monitoring can provide between 1.2 to $1.6 million a year per thousand patients. So providers not only provide better care through remote aims, they can also increase their revenues. And this is a huge opportunity for the relevant digital health companies. And of course, the consumers don't stay behind. This is again a graph of how consumers embrace digital health. And you see the jump that happened uh, from the end of 19 to the end of uh, March 20. So it's a change that we are witnessing both on the uh, healthcare system side, on the regulation and reimbursement side, but also on the uh, patients and population adoption side. And this creates like the perfect storm in the good sense for digital health to move from a vision to a reality and to uh, what it implies to digital health startups. Thank you very much, Yossi. That was fascinating. And it really, I think it really made uh, clear why are we asking these questions of what will say, what will get left behind? Now, um, I would like to ask you to imagine the next uh, scenario. So if you remember, some of you might are still in lockdown when there was a lockdown. You might have been in a situation where you felt a little pain in your throat and you said, well, I'll make myself a cup of tea. I'll let it, stay. I'll wait a day or two and I'll see what happens. But what, but the question is, what if you need to go to your doctor when there's lockdown? And this question becomes much more complicated if you are in isolation with, um, with, and, and you're worried that you might have catched the coronavirus. So I would like to ask you, we're gonna now put a poll on your screen. You can answer, we would love to hear your uh, thoughts. If you really found that uh, scenario uh, familiar, if you needed to go to the doctor during the lockdown, so take a moment to, get to send your answers. We will have the results on our screens in about 10 seconds. So 10 less seconds, it will be 10, nine, eight. All right, let's close the poll and see the results. No and yes, all right. All right, so 40% of you said they needed to see the doctor. I'm sure this was a bit challenging and um, more about these challenges and, the, and what Taitocare is being doing to overcome them, we will hear from Eyal Baum, Director of Strategic Accounts at Taito, who, Taito Care, who is really coming from the front lines of fighting this uh, pandemic. So Eyal, please. Hi everyone, so just to relate to the uh, questionnaire, so luckily, you know, the last wave, if you might say the wave, uh, have been in the summer, let's say, but if we look at the upcoming winter where also the flu will be in parallel to COVID, definitely this could be another a different scenario. And then I believe the, the questionnaire will be different. So just to give you a quick uh, introduction about Taito. Uh, Taito is a telemedicine company, already exists for eight years and we are three and a half years already on the market, focused mainly on the US, but active worldwide, including Israel, Europe, and Asia. Uh, I will do a very quick introduction about the product and focus about our uh, activities uh, uh, with COVID-19. Uh, so just, uh, um, uh, just about the product, so it's a full platform and set of connected devices that basically enables a remote physician, GP, pediatrician, or any primary care physician to conduct an, a remote comprehensive physical exam exactly just in the clinic. So we are replicating what you as a patient, you as a doctor get in the clinic. Now you get them as part of a virtual consult. Uh, and when I'm saying a physical exam, basically we have four uh, devices enabling eight examination. You see here the list of the common examination that we enable. 
And of course, for COVID-19, the temperature and the lungs exam are the more uh, relevant examination to monitoring, the, the monitor the, the condition of the respiratory conditioning, allowing uh, patients to be under quarantine while preventing a direct contact between the patient and doctor. So we see very, very high uh, usage of the lungs exams during COVID-19. Uh, a little bit more about the product. So it's a full platform. You can see we have a mobile lab at the patient side, a web clinician app. It's a cloud platform, fully secured, HIPAA and GDPR compliant. And we have an API that can interface with different EMR or telehealth platform. Uh, it can work either on a live mode as part of a video call where the doctor is getting remote control of the devices and conducting the exams together with the patient, or it's more in an offline exam where then we're using our AI capabilities to help patients to do, to do those examinations in a diagnostic quality. In terms of the product, we have two product lines. One is tied to home, which is more for family or chronic patients or any remote patient monitoring uh, requirements. And we have Taito Pro, which can support different use cases like traveling nurses, uh, pharmacies, employer virtual clinics, remote clinics, and more. Uh, you can see here a glimpse about our customers. Uh, as we said, our main market is the US. We have a, more than 80 uh, health systems of different kinds using Taito already, either Taito Pro like Kaiser Permanente, using in remote clinics or, or uh, visiting nurses to care homes. We have Clalit in Israel. Uh, in Europe, we have Suica, which is a, a big health insurer offering title. So many, many health systems and health insurers already use our system. And now Shiba as well uh, has expanded, uh, and I will elaborate about it uh, in a few minutes. So I will try now to focus on how we are uh, helping the fight against COVID. So the title, again, it's a platform with the potential. You can use it in many uh, scenarios. One is remote monitoring, you know, prevent the, the need of patients with potentially COVID to come to the clinic and get exposed to other patients or getting, you know, protecting the medical team from getting exposed to COVID patients, traveling clinicians. We have a lot of experience now going to care homes, triaging of patients, uh, senior care facilities. We have a lot of projects now in Israel, in Europe, at the US. Uh, of nurses or caregivers that are, kind, are coming to such care homes. You know the number of deaths in Europe, so uh, you understand why this uh, usage has increased dramatically. And we also see in quarantine sites uh, a lot of usage. So let's give a little few examples uh, about our experience. Uh, so one experience is with Sheba, Sheba Medical Center in Israel, the largest health, system, health center in Israel and one of the top 10 in the world. Um, I'll show a quick video. Again, I will not, uh, we don't have time to go over it completely, but this is an example of uh, Shiba has used it both within the hospital and quarantine areas, also for uh, uh, care homes. What you see here is a home hospitalization kit that uh, uh, Shiba provided to COVID patients. Uh, you can see here the live mode, the online mode, where uh, here is Dr. Uh, Gadi Segal. Uh, He's monitoring remotely COVID patients with mild symptoms. You know, the target is not to bring everyone to the hospital and admit everyone, but only the uh, severe cases. So TITO allows the doctors to release patients in more confidence without, you know, the risk of uh, a deterioration without knowing and without knowing in advance. So this gave Sheba and other hospitals, we are now installed in 18 hospitals in Israel, the confidence to release more patients to the home uh, without the risk of deterioration uh, suddenly. Um, so, um, uh, so as I said, it's also used almost in all larger hospitals in Israel, either within the hospitals, also in Corona hotels, and in uh, visiting nurses. Uh, another example is in Thailand. In Thailand, our partner there, which is Samiti Veg Hospital, it's a large private hospital group, part of BDMS, the largest private health group in Thailand. They also uh, deploy Taito in all of their 48 uh, private hospitals uh, for quarantined uh, areas, and also donated 200 Taito Pro devices to government hospitals. So the prime minister gave his blessing to that. So we see also very high demand and usage within uh, Thai hospitals. Uh, another example is in Europe, uh, uh, in different countries. This is an example of uh, Freiburg Hospital, which is a big a public hospital in Switzerland uh, that they've built a team of nurses that are going to care homes using the title platform, using the title devices to perform 
remote diagnostic uh, quality examination and preventing the need both uh, of, of bringing the elderly to the hospitals, saving a lot of deaths potentially, uh, and also you know, allowing the doctors to, to treat much more patients in less time. Um, as I said, we also have a very big project with SWICA in Switzerland in home use where we see much, uh, there are all, all, already thousands of devices deployed and we see higher usage of the site, of both in Switzerland and our partners in the US and also with Clalit in Israel. And as also mentioned, we have a few hospitals in Italy using that as well. And last slide, uh, another nice example, this is also uh, happening in a few health systems in the US like Oshner and Ovant and Sanford uh, using Taito and also in Israeli Corona hotels where patients with mild symptoms admitted to Corona hotels in case as part of a phone call, the physician feels there might be some uh, worsening of the condition. He asks the patient to go to a room, to a title station, and allow them to do the physical exam, listening to the lungs, and I detect if there is a, a, a problem that requires the patient to be admitted back to the hospital. Uh, so that's, that's it for my side. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Eyal. That was fascinating. Keep the good work going. Um, I see already that there are questions piling up for you, so check the Q&A. And this is also a reminder for you to continue asking great questions. But this is really, you know, we have here some, as I said, some of the brightest minds in the field. So feel free to ask anything. Now, um, I would like to ask you a question. You know, you saw Yossi, Yossi's presentation, you saw Eyal's presentation, and I would, I, I, would, I would like to ask if you can tell us your estimation of what is the annual cost of health of healthcare um, globally. So we will pull the question now, and you already know the drill. So take a moment to answer, and let's see your estimation. I will tell you that um, our next speaker, David Arel, is going to answer that and more. David is the co-founder and CEO of Site Reason. Let's see the re let's see the results. Can we see the results? All right. So most people estimate that the number is 11 trillion dollars let's see if it is david will tell us he won't tell us now but um i think what is so interesting about site reason is how it is a magnificent example of the power of ai and what ai can do in the field of pharmaceuticals so i would like to present the vidarel ceo of site reason to tell us what site reason is doing and how this is part of the huge transformation and acceleration we are seeing in digital health Thank you, Alon. Um, let's see, here we go. So uh, I want to touch briefly today on uh, AI in pharmaceutical R&D and specifically uh, touch on several trends that we have seen uh, strengthening uh, through the pandemic and try to think what might stay post the pandemic. Couple of words on Cytoreason. Cytoreason is uh, using AI to uh, enable drug discovery and development. Basically, uh, the Cytoreason platform is making drug development more accurate, more affordable, and much faster. Uh, and that is basically making the drugs relevant for smaller patient populations. And when we think about it, the smallest patient population we can think of is one patient. So this is enabling the pharmaceutical companies to become a lot more personalized in the, their treatment, getting us closer to the grand vision of personalized uh, healthcare. Uh, Cider Reason is uh, customer base, uh, includes some of the largest pharma companies in the world. Most of the top 10 pharma companies are customers of ours. It's based on uh, over a decade of research at Stanford at the Technion by my co-founders. And the company has been around for three years and the data that we accumulated cost for production over $600 million. And basically when we think about the data, the new technologies they're enabling um, pharmaceutical R&D, they're, they're kept in silos. So pharma grade data, the data that is used for pharmaceutical R&D is mostly kept in the different companies and it's not being shared across the industry. 
And basically, Cider Reason is, is, is becoming the hub of pharma data when all these different companies are sharing their data with uh, Cider Reason. We're training our models using them and making the models accessible for the different companies without the risk of competition. So if we think for a second on what exactly Cider Reason technology does, so we are taking the big data, we're taking the measurements, all the data that has been accumulated throughout the clinical trials on one hand, and we are taking the knowledge. So all the scientific literature and all the discoveries that are documented, and we're bringing them together and putting them together in a cell level model, which is what uh, biologists or uh, researchers in the industry uh, need to make drug discovery faster and better. And then there is a component of machine learning that every new trial that we get exposed to is improving the accuracy of the models. The uh, drugs are basically used by the, uh, the technology is used by the pharmaceutical companies in the earlier phases for discovery, identifying new targets. Also, it's used in the later stages of the pipeline. So basically, when you have a drug that is doing pretty well and you want to improve its accuracy, improve its performance, or expand its market, and obviously in approved drugs, uh, for look, looking at combinations and expanding the markets, finding new diseases that these drugs can, ha can handle. Specifically with, uh, in the COVID situation, our customers, as you probably um, can figure out, had most of the drugs in the market. And when Corona, uh, when the Corona star uh, crisis started, we, in, in a matter of days, we put together a model of ARDS. ARDS is the condition uh, that is uh, it's what's called the cytokine storm, the, um, um, the condition that most severe corona patients died from. And we were able to take our customers' drugs and very quickly, within a matter of days, identify which drug might help in an ARDS situation. And that led almost within uh, two weeks to allow the big pharma companies to file for the, with the FDA for starting clinical trials of ARDS. But that's not exactly, that's not the only thing I wanted to talk about today. I wanted to talk about the different trends that AI brought to the pharma industry, the pharma R&D. So what have happened? The one, the one main element, the main axis that the AI was measured on is on the pace. Throughout the past few weeks, Everything in pharma had to be moved, had to move very quickly, very different than the typical way of pharmaceutical R&D. And the main question was whether it's more accurate. So let me go quickly through the main thing, main applications. So as, as the example I gave with what Cider Reason was doing, drug repurposing, so using one drug that is approved for a specific indication to a different indication, that's a major, uh, that was a major innovation that was required throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, evaluating drug candidates. So mostly for pharmaceutical companies, the large companies to decide which drugs of a smaller company they might wanna help push. Expedient readouts of, of uh, results. So many trials were going on, on, were going on and many uh, new trials were started. A lot of the, um, a lot of the companies were, were required to understand what is going on in their, in their trials, not in a matter of months as it typically was, but in a matter of uh, days or weeks. Obviously the identification of subpopulation has been critical. So understanding which group of patients, so which group of patient is gonna respond or which group of patient its condition is gonna worsen more than others. These are questions related to biology, obviously on the other side of the pharma uh, R&D, the chemistry, there were other uh, AI applications such as protein uh, structure simulation, understanding the structure of the, of, the, um, of the virus and drug design very quickly coming up with new ideas. But there is something else I wanna to talk to you about. And that's the trend that I think is gonna stick around post COVID-19. Throughout the pandemic, 
many of the lab animals were in facilities were shut down. And basically that critically stopped a lot of the work that uh, the pharmaceutical companies were doing. But let's talk for a second what mice are used for in, in, this, in this industry. So millions of mice basically are sacrificed in the process of drug development and drug discovery. And the process is the idea is let's cure a mouse and then try to cure a human. But the re reality is that still of the top 10 diseases, 15 million people die each year, $8 trillion of annual healthcare costs, and that's your answer, I guess, um, is still being spent. Huge advancement in science are happening, but still phase three trials are still failing in an ever growing phase. So this is not working. And the one thing that happened throughout the, the Corona crisis has been the, understand, the, under, the understanding that uh, animal models are not necessarily gonna be the future of drug development and computational models can replace animal models in certain areas, obviously not all. And what we are expecting is that over a long period of time, starting now, the mice and the animal models gradually will be left out of the R&D and would be replaced by technology adoption and probably tying it to what Yossi uh, Bagon said earlier, the technology adoption is happening in big corporations in the best way they can do, not only with the consumers. So with that optimistic uh, view and cute mouse picture, uh, I would like to thank you. If you have any other questions, I'm here either on the chat or in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And thank you for this fascinating example of what AI can do, continue the good work. Now, the next company, so I, I must tell you, one of the things that, things that struck me is that we're talking about such, such advanced technology today. And you know, when you think about medication, so you still think about these little plastics of sorting your medication and it seems like so old. Now, these days are gonna be over very soon, but before we're gonna learn how, I would like to ask you, if you ever got confused with your medication. So we're gonna have this question here, take a moment to answer. All right, let's see the results. And okay, all right. So most of you are or well organized, but there's still a very nice portion of people saying that they did got confused with their medication. This problem is real, it is serious, and it is not funny at all, but Gladly, we have Omri Shore, CEO of MediSafe, here with us today to tell us how MediSafe is going to remove this problem from the world. So, Omri, please. Thank you very much, Alon, and uh, thank you for, um, and to our crowd for inviting me today. So, my name is Omri. I'm the co-founder and CEO at MediSafe. I started the company because of a medication confusion with, with my father, which uh, almost killed him. But today we're going to talk about other things. Um, so just a bit of an intro, Medisef is the leading digital therapeutics company, and we're partnering with pharmaceutical companies to provide medication management solutions for patients across the entire healthcare continuum. Um, we have uh, nearly 7 million registered users, which makes us the world leader to that extent. Uh, we have 350,000 user reviews. And with an average of uh, 4.7 out of five stars um, satisfaction. And we've managed to date more than 2 billion medication doses uh, for our patients. Uh, what we're focused on is really digitally holding, hand holding patients from the fulfillment of the prescription when the patient is, uh, is taking the prescription and needs to get uh, the, the medications to their doorsteps. Uh, throughout the initiation process where the first take of the drug is happening and all the way to maintenance and creating the right routines, MediSafe is using AI-driven uh, digital companions 
to support patients throughout their journey in the medication management. And when you talk about these digital companions, they're allowing connectivity to patients, the constant monitoring of what's happening with the patient, influencing their behaviors, uh, interventions to their patients in a timely manner, obviously resources to guide these patients, and it connects the patients to the support. And this is an area that I'm gonna to highlight uh, today later in the presentation. Let's talk quickly about COVID-19 world. So we're in an unprecedented times. The world is constantly uh, uh, changing on us. And this is driving uh, lots of strain on the current healthcare models and shifting us to the future models. Uh, when patient anxiety and the isolation of these patients is creating overwhelming social distancing. Uh, MediSafe in April ran a survey, and what we have seen that 55% uh, of the patients are concerned uh, that the coronavirus would interfere with their medication regimen. This is 10% from what happened back in March. So what we did is to uh, create a survey. And again, we have um, over 7 million registered users. So by the click of the button, we ran a survey out and uh, we had about 7,500 respondents uh, of that survey. And the majority of them are in the US. Uh, we, uh, we sent most of the surveys in the US. So that was, uh, that was uh, by design and we saw responses from all variety of ages. So let's uh, double click on the survey. First and foremost, patients are concerned, uh, mainly about their um, um, health, and we talked about taking the medications. 53% uh, reported that they're uh, concerned about accessing their medications, and 42% were concerned about how would they get treated in, if infected. But because we have access to these patients, we can tell you that 59% uh, was the rate with depression patients. And mostly cancer patients were very concerned about the fact that meds would make them uh, vulnerable. So here are some, uh, some things that we found out. We ran an additional uh, survey uh, to assess that uh, responded, uh, responses varied by the conditions. So we had the capability of uh, segmenting that and we wanted to validate the patient support needs. By the way, the survey and the infographics that you see here is available online. So um, I'm happy to share that uh, with, uh, with the group here. And, and patients, we were interested in learning more about their digital health habits. So as you can see here, 47% uh, of the patients were missing doctor's appointments, uh, which is truly alarming. But when you segment that, you find out that GI and UC patients are more prevalent to that. And RA and lymphomas are 50% of them, over 50% are missing doctor's appointments. Uh, thankfully, we saw that many more are using uh, telehealth uh, specifically, we saw 49% usage uh, in, or interest in usage in the U.S. We saw 51% uh, uh, in younger populations and depression patients in general are uh, more active with that. And finally, patients are missing labs, but we see that cancer patients, 30% of them have reported they're missing labs. So this is a huge concern that, uh, that the industry um, is solving. Also, patients require more support, and we asked them, how can we help? And you see here the word cloud. They said, keep updating me. Uh, uh, I think this type of uh, touching base is really important. So uh, what we did is to launch a companion that is focused on COVID-19. And uh, if you're a MediSafe patient, you have likely seen this uh, coming. So uh, there was a bit of a Q&A here. And then as a result of that, uh, we launched the COVID-19 companion for patients, which is a resource center. And it's powered by Everyday Health in the US. We have a great partnership with them around that. 
So shifting back to, uh, to what's current, the current patient support process. So currently it is, it is the clinician with the patient. So this is the traditional one-to-one -one communication that is happening to give you a real world um, um, picture. This is how it looks like. So you're talking about nurses in call centers and the world is changing. So we're shifting to a point where this, uh, this healthcare professional has the capacity of supporting many, many patients. Uh, and they do that through the digital connectivity and MediSafe's uh, digital companions. Uh, so we believe that the need for that digital support is here to stay. The digital therapeutics is more scalable than the, and affordable than the current patient support models. In general, a pharma company will pay um, about $25 million a year for this type of service that you've seen. And then obviously uh, digital therapeutics can support um, in a much more scalable and affordable way. Uh, it allows the AI driven uh, dynamic personalization to support patients. So no more one size fits all in supporting patients. We're using AI for that. We're, we're offering on-demand resources so you can get healthcare the way that you get banking today, the way that you get um, your travel agents, which is uh, through the app at any given time. It's reliable and it's validated. You, um, you offer a holistic approach that adapts to the person's daily life. And finally, and I think almost most importantly, you collect massive amounts of real world and real time data. So just to summarize what MediSafe's platform offers, uh, from initiation, we're supporting patients access to medications with a set of tools that, that can even deliver the medications to the patient's doorstep. Through the medication management, where our personalized digital companion are supporting the patients and what you see here in the small picture is an example of how do you inject the drug and it comes exactly when you're supposed to do that. And by that, we increase the adherence of the patients by eight to 20%. And I'll finish with the measurable outcomes and the capacity of a patient support service um, a nurse to support patients and to understand what's going on with them to create great uh, outcomes for them. And this is all enabled by the digital companions. So with that, uh, I will thank you so much for the time. I'll stop sharing here. Uh, happy to be in touch and you can see my email here on the screen. Thank you very much, Omri. And it is definitely, I'm, I'm now assured after seeing this and of course, by knowing MediSafe, that this is such a promising solution and we're going to remove this problem of any confusion with medication and uh, your team is doing a great job, continue the good work. So I would like to invite you all to join us for our next webinar in two weeks, uh, happening July 23rd, same time. And we would love to see you there. We're going to be, co we're going to be covering uh, corporate innovation with Dan Fischel, who presented earlier. Um, just as a reminder, I would like to do a quick summary of what we discussed today. So we had a quick overview of our crowd, a quick overview of corporate innovation. Then we had a presentation by Yossi about digital health and what is happening uh, currently. Um, we had presentations from Eyal from Taito Care, David from Saito Reason, and Omri now from MediSafe. Thank you everyone. It was great having you with us. See you in our next webinar, July 23rd.